This evening's program is sponsored by the Winter Harbor Agency. If you're in the agency sometime in the future, say thank you on our behalf, and maybe they'll pay for another one next year. People have been coming to Maine and to the Stuttgart Peninsula for a very long time, and they've been leaving trash behind for a very long time. <laughs> uh, we call them, uh, for the, the ancient ones, we call them shell middens. Sounds better than trash pile. <laughs> But at any rate, um, to talk about Shell Midden's past, present, and future, we are pleased to welcome this evening uh, from the University of Maine in Orono, uh, Dr. Uh, Alice Kelly and Dr. Bonnie Newsom, who are going to present uh, this evening's program. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Bonnie Newsom no Fleewees, Nagapan Wabskanel. Hello, my name is Bonnie Newsom. I'm a citizen of the Penobscot Nation. I'm also on the faculty at the University of Maine. I like to open my talks in uh, my language as an indigenous person and um, uh, just as a, a little reminder that uh, you know the language and our um, our communities are still very vibrant and active here. And uh, I just happen to explore our past and um, I think it's an important acknowledgement that um, we have a number of communities in Maine that are uh, descendants of the folks that we're going to learn about tonight. So, And I want to thank you all for inviting us to speak tonight. Dr. Kelly and I are going to tag team our presentation, and I'll begin with a general overview of uh, archaeological shell heaps and highlight their research and social value and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Kelly and she'll um, discuss our Middenminders uh, initiative, which is a citizen science strategy for documenting and monitoring um, the degradation of archaeological uh, shell heaps in, in Maine. I want to start tonight's presentation with the University of Maine's Indigenous Land Acknowledgement. Um, it's a real special privilege for us to be able to do this work and um, uh, we are, have a great opportunity to engage in the indigenous heritage sites and this land acknowledgement really articulates the deep and important um, connections between Maine's uh, indigenous peoples and um, in the places where we all call home. And uh, it's an important reminder uh, of those uh, who cared for this homeland uh, in the past and the relationship between past and present peoples. So it says the University of Maine recognizes that it's located on Marsh Island in the homeland of the Penobscot Nation, where issues of water and territorial rights and encroachment upon sacred sites are ongoing. Penobscot homeland is connected to the other Wabanaki tribal nations, the Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq, through kinship, alliances, and diplomacy. The university also recognizes that the Penobscot nation and other Wabanaki uh, tribal nations are distinct sovereign legal and political entities with their own powers of self-governance and self-determination. And uh, somebody was asking about uh, our uh, organization as uh, Wabanaki communities. Um, and the symbol on the left is the Wabanaki Confederacy symbol. And we've, uh, Wabanaki people in Maine form a confederacy. And you'll notice that one end is closed with a double curve design and the other end is open. That allows for um, freedom for any of our groups to come and go. So we're not bound to this confederacy, um, and the, the symbol really uh, showcases that. It, it allows us to come and go from the confederacy as we please. So, so with that, I will turn now to talk about shell heaps. So shell heaps, or uh, sometimes called middens, are cultural spaces along Maine's coastline, and they reflect past accumulation um, of shell that people have uh, deposited on the landscape, and usually uh, it's associated with harvesting shellfish, of course. And these sites are not, um, types of sites are not unique to Maine, they occur all over the world in both uh, coastal and riverine settings. 
Uh, here in Maine, they appear to be restricted to coastal areas. Uh, most Maine shell heaps document roughly the last 3,000 years of uh, Wabanaki lifeways. However, older ones, particularly in this area of our state, um, do occur, and uh, as do more recent shell heaps. So, there, and I'll talk a little bit about that in, in a bit. Um, these two slides uh, show some images of shell heaps in Maine. Uh, the one on the left is, on my left, is Pass Point, and that's made up of largely soft shell clam. Uh, we also have oyster shell heaps, which are down on the Damariscotta River. If any of you have ever been down there, these are huge um, uh, uh, shell heaps, meters thick, uh, on, on the riverbank there. So, um, but primarily most of our shell heaps in Maine are, um, uh, are soft shell clam. Uh, and the term midden really has become kind of this catch-all term that um, uh, by definition does suggest garbaging behavior. And I think that in many cases, people, these were considered um, places where people deposited refuse. Um, however, we know that uh, particularly at locations like Damariscotta, that these are very prominent on the landscape. And in some cases may even be markers of sorts. Um, they could have been an intentional landmark. We sometimes find people buried uh, at these locations, which would signify something other than garbage. And so um, uh, I think it's important that we, we um, understand that uh, shell heaps served a variety of purposes. And um, we, we don't know all of those purposes, but we, that's what we're trying to understand. Um, so there are... Uh, roughly 2,000 shell heap sites present on the coast of Maine, and they vary in size and setting. On one end of the spectrum, we have the very large oyster shell heap, and that's the uh, Glidden Midden down at Damariscotta. Um, this is uh, the largest shell heap in the northeast, 30 meters thick, so it's huge. Um, and then uh, in other, other shell heaps, such as uh, the one in Washington County, are much smaller and um, are not as prominent. And these smaller shell heaps may be remnants of perhaps a once larger shell, shell mound, um, but they're mostly gone due to erosion or other things. Um, they also could reflect uh, use of a place during, uh, for short term, maybe by limited numbers of families. Um, many, like uh, the ones on the bottom uh, images, are located in exposed areas. And uh, this makes them vulnerable both to uh, human um, uh, and natural impacts. We know uh, that shell heap sites are complex stratigraphically and often reflect very dynamic uh, cultural spaces in which uh, human activities change over time and space. Uh, it's not uncommon to find shell-free zones in, within these sites, and this may be evidence of uh, uh, site abandonment or alternate uses during certain periods of time. And you can see uh, the example here of a shell heap site with very thick deposits. Um, this is in Munskungus Bay. Uh, and the one uh, on your right is uh, in Machias Bay. And uh, let me see if I can find my pointer here. Oh, darn. She warned me about that. <laughs> uh, there it is. So you can see here that there's a very thin layer of shell and maybe a little bit here. Um, and so shell mounds aren't always like this. You know, they're not always a, a really full deposit of shell. Um, sometimes they're, they're very sparse, but we still consider them shell heaps nonetheless. Um, so uh, occasionally archaeologists encounter things like house floors in, in these shell heaps, hearth features, human mortuary features, um, dog burials. The site on uh, my left is a place where they uh, recovered uh, uh, two dogs that had been buried um, ceremonially at that location. So um, 
the point here is that they produce a lot of other things other than shells and artifacts. So perhaps one of the most uh, notable characteristics of shell heaps is uh, their preservation of varied data sets. So because the shells act as uh, a preservation agent of sorts, um, it, the shells actually reduce the acidity in the main soils. If you go inland and you have a site on the interior of Maine, the soils are so acidic that they actually um, will erode uh, bone tools and, and other kinds of organics. Well, that doesn't happen at shell heaps. Uh, fortunately, these sites contain artifacts and what we call eco-facts. Eco-fact is something that humans bring to the site. They may not modify it, but they may use it. Um, uh, so things like uh, seeds or uh, the shells themselves would be considered eco-facts if they aren't modified in any way. Um, but you, you get things that are preserved, like shell beads, um, plant remains. Uh, that's a uh, dog bone jaw. Uh, those are fish otoliths. So, uh, the, our good fortune as archaeologists is that the shells actually help us um, to understand past life ways because they preserve much more than what we would find on the interior of Maine. Um, and so, uh, one of the other, so these things that we find, these organics, help record uh, past life ways, but also past environments as well. So, what we have here. Um, most, as I mentioned, most shell heap sites in Maine are about 3,000 years old or younger. Some date uh, to uh, some very old, much older than that, between four and 5,000 years ago. Uh, what we see, though, is that, what, uh, that these shell heaps record about, up to, can record up to 5,000 years of paleo-environmental information. So we can get information on past species that inhabited the Gulf of Maine. Um, uh, we can uh, understand seasonality. We can understand changing climates and temperature. Uh, we've recovered uh, swordfish from some of the sites in Maine as, as, um, uh, as an indicator that we had warmer waters at certain time periods. We also uh, see some evidence of uh, uh, extinct species. So the great auk and sea mink were both hunted to extinction, but we find uh, bones of those species in the shell heaps and that allows us to um, study those and have a better understanding of how those species uh, fit within uh, indigenous life. <clears throat> so material remains recovered from shell heaps uh, such as stone tools and pottery and uh, bone tools also provide a window into you know, people's philosophies on materiality. We can examine how their material culture changed through time and space, and we can learn about their discard practices, and maybe even reflect on how they differ from our own. Um, good preservation allows us to explore past technologies, and we see some examples here um, of some of the materials that we can recover from these uh, shell heaps, uh, stone tools, arrowheads, people are pretty familiar with those. Um, we also get indigenous ceramics, and people started making and using clay pots about 3,000 years ago here in Maine, and so we see remnants of those pots in the shell heap. Uh, we also get uh, uh, things like shell beads, and um, the bird bone flute, is a, uh, that's a specimen that was recovered from Skudik uh, Peninsula. So, you know, it gives us some insight into music and, you know, moves people outside the realm of hunting and fishing, which is often what we think about when we think about people living in the past. Um, we can also learn about technology. Um, bone harpoon. Uh, harpoons are often uh, recovered in these, at these locations, and um, it's an amazing technology, some of these uh, toggle harpoons that people were actually using and, you know, perhaps getting things like swordfish. <laughs> so you have to remember that that's um, uh, uh, one of the things that always amazes me is how actually sophisticated indigenous peoples were um, and were able to make uh, use of their materials in an efficient way. 
in order to survive in, uh, in Maine for probably 12,000 years. Um, and we also occasionally will find copper in uh, shell heaps, and this rarely preserves in interior sites, and so that can tell us a lot about how people moved about the landscape, whether or not they traded um, uh, from different places in, in the northeast or beyond. So um, these are really uh, special places that produce materials that we wouldn't necessarily find elsewhere. Um, shell heaps also preserve uh, what we call cultural features, and a feature is anything that, um, it's not an artifact, but it's anything that's created by humans that you, you can't pick up and take to the lab, so to speak, <laughs> you know. So something like um, a fire hearth or a house floor, um, and in one of the uh, um, sites that we do our field school at, we found this, well, my predecessor, Dr. Brian Robinson, found this standing stone. And we know that, you know, the, the processes, the natural processes that deposited this other uh, material did not put that stone there, uh, right? So people put it there. We don't know why they put it there, um, but it could have been a marker of sorts or some sort of... Um, uh, uh, navigational aid or something. We're just un uncertain about um, what that might have been. But we do find things like that on occasion. Here, it's a little difficult to see, but you can see this dark staining that could have been remnants of a fire hearth or, or some other activity that people were engaged in that left a lot of organic material behind. So, and these are great for things like uh, charcoal. So if we want to uh, get a radiocarbon date if we want, if, if there's charcoal within that, we can send that off and get a date and we'll know how, at least how old this, this was and everything above it is obviously younger. And then sometimes we'll also find house floors. Um, and this is uh, uh, the, uh, a boundary to a house floor that was excavated by a colleague of mine, uh, Gabe Hrynek, who works out of the University of New Brunswick. Sometimes house floors are dug in, uh, other times they're not, but generally tend to be circular, and you can see evidence of that in uh, some of these locations. So, um, one of the things about this, uh, about shell heaps, is that um, in addition to kind of all of this uh, amazing scientific information that we can uh, acquire from them, uh, we can also uh, learn, well, they, they carry important cultural and heritage and social value as well. Um, as I mentioned, most of these locations record uh, past indigenous lifeways, and uh, as such, they're important and irreplaceable heritage resources. So as, you know, kind of historic preservation folks I suspect many of you are interested in that, um, in this room. This is one area where uh, you can actually um, uh, bring that history to life uh, by engaging in the archaeological work and connecting it to contemporary peoples. Um, so, as our title mentioned, you know, once these uh, Shell heaps are gone, they're gone for good. So it's like anything historical, you can't recreate it, right? Um, it's something that has to be um, appreciated uh, and um, studied at, at the time, and particularly given the issues around erosion and other things that, are, that Dr. Kelly will talk about here in a minute. Um, there are, uh, for those of you who don't know, there are four federally recognized tribes in Maine, uh, the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot, and much of their history or our history is encapsulated in these subsurface spaces. And so, although Maine tribes have done really well to um, uh, maintain many distinct cultural uh, uh, traditions, um, you know, the they have been, their, their practices and heritage has been disrupted uh, through uh, efforts of assimilation and um, religious conversion during the period of European contact. Um, so also, uh, many of these 
these communities have no access to um, the same cultural spaces as they once did. And so Shell Heap research actually uh, helps uh, reconnect people to some of uh, that heritage and identity. Um, so research and preservation and documentation of shell heaps is one way to um, uh, kind of bring back some of those traditional knowledges back to indigenous peoples today. And so, you know, as, um, as I mentioned earlier about the large uh, oyster shell heaps, um, these represent our built heritage. You know, it's something that people actually built on the landscape. And um, like many indigenous peoples across the globe, uh, Wabanaki people's histories and uh, cultural spaces are um, often marginalized. And so, whoops. Um, and so, one of the things that uh, we know uh, connects indigenous peoples to, um, to these uh, shell heaps is uh, oral narratives. And Wabanaki people have maintained their connections to these shell heaps, and good examples of this can be found in uh, the 19th century writings of Joseph Nicola. Uh, Joseph Nicola was, among other things, a Penobscot representative to the Maine legislature. And in 1893, he self-published Life and Traditions of the Red Man. And this is a book uh, that he wrote to kind of narrate Penobscot traditions um, for a very broad audience. And he drew uh, from his personal knowledges, uh, believing that indigenous peoples were uh, really the only ones qualified uh, to convey information about indigenous lifeways. And among uh, Nicola's stories are references to shellfish and shell heaps. And so, for example, he shares a story where Glooskab, which is um, a, a, one of our culture heroes, takes a journey across the land, and along the way, he encounters people and animals who guide him uh, in various aspects of life. And one such encounter was with um, Mei Mei, with the woodpecker. And Mei Mei helps him kill a giant serpent uh, from the ocean. And as a mark of friendship, Glooskab dips uh, his arrow into the bloody ocean water and touches Mei Mei's head, uh, marking him as a friend um, for life. And so after the serpent is killed, uh, Mei Mei flies away towards the setting sun, but re returns frequently to bring Glooskab food. And then one morning, Glooskab wakes to the sound of a dog barking. Um, from the direction of the setting sun, and Glooskab calls to the animal, and a dog appears with meat in his mouth, which um, he places at Glooskab's feet. Um, appreciative of Glooskab's efforts to kill the serpent, the dog says, I have come to stay with you. I, I shall stay uh, where and when you stay, and I shall go when and where you go. And if any of you are dog owners, you know that that's the case or at least we hope that that's the case. <laughs> um, and eventually the woodpecker stops bringing food to Glooskab. And um, because they, the woodpecker felt that it was time for Glooskab to find food on his own. And this is when the dog steps in and, uh, in, and becomes the real companion. And he takes Glooskab down to the mud flats and um, near the edge of the waters. And guess what he shows him how to do? He shows him how to dig for clams. And so the dog is actually, uh, you know, the, the, the being that brought shellfish into the lives of the Wabanaki people. And so on occasion, we do see reference to the dog in archaeological uh, settings. As I mentioned, we see ceremonially that dogs are buried in, in some of these places. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think this story is one way that we can begin to connect contemporary peoples uh, with what we're seeing um, uh, on the landscape. So, uh, shell heaps are not solely indigenous um, uh, repositories. Uh, we also find uh, European goods as well. Um, Settler heritage and post-colonial heritage is represented in them, in them um, not as, as 
uh, frequently as indigenous uh, representation, but certainly um, often enough to, to note them. Um, the Holmes Point West site, which is in Machias Bay, produced both indigenous and non-indigenous cultural materials. And for example, uh, the St. Orange Pot, uh, let me see if I can get this, this one here, um, this was recovered uh, from Machias Bay during our field school. Um, it's French in origin and likely dates to somewhere between 1610 and 1676. Um, the English chamber pot uh, over here uh, was quite a find, um, and it uh, dates to the early to mid-1700s. Uh, it was also recovered from the same site where we found indigenous materials as well. Um, this figurine in the center is from Malaga Island, which um, uh, uh, it has diverse cultural representations there as well, and um, this in particular, you know, we see evidence of children, and sometimes when we're thinking about archaeology, we often forget that there are elders and aunties and children and all kinds of people that make up families, and so, you know, I try and encourage students to think about looking uh, for um, various representatives of any society. So um, these uh, types of things are uh, good indicators of things like cross-cultural relations, um, uh, shared use of space, maybe land encroachment, and um, uh, you know how the, the land came to shift over time. So with that as background, I want to talk now about a couple of uh, sites in this region. This is a 1940 map of archaeological sites in Frenchman's Bay, and it was drafted by John Rowe, um, who uh, worked for Harvard. And uh, as you can see, this area is archaeologically rich, um, and uh, these sites preserve a very long record of indigenous uh, engagement with this location. Um, and uh, so you can see there's a couple sites here that I'll, I just want to briefly touch on. Taft Point and uh, Waterside, which is not sitting on there. Did it not get it? Anyway. It's on the left below Sorrento. It's on the left below Sorrento. There it is. Yeah, right there. So um, in the, both of these sites are really important in, in part uh, because of what they preserve, but also in, uh, in terms of how old they are. So the Waterside uh, site is located uh, in the town of Sorrento, and it was owned by the Rowe family until it was donated to uh, the Archaeological Conservancy in uh, 1999. And it was excavated by John Rowe on behalf of Harvard's uh, Excavator Club in uh, 1938 and 1940. And Rowe published on these excavations um, in 1940. And at that time, he had identified two occupations. And um, he delineated these based on uh, the presence and absence of pottery. And so native peoples in the area started making and using clay pots at about 3,000 years ago. Um, uh, and Rowe noted the difference, you know, those people who made pots and those people who didn't. Um, and uh, he interpreted them as reflective of two different cultures. Uh, and he actually used indigenous names uh, to label the two occupations in uh, Wakeg and Astaku, and you may be familiar with those terms. Um, and uh, uh, this, this site um, is one of a handful of sites on the main coast that actually has evidence of native peoples taking swordfish roughly uh, four to 5,000 years ago. So it's a pretty important site. It is owned by the um, Archaeological Conservancy today, and it's really a fragment of what it actually once was. And um, it, uh, it's one of the uh, um, few sites that has important implications for understanding changes in uh, ocean temperatures uh, in the past. So. Uh, uh, Rowe's publication included illustrations uh, from some of the material culture that uh, he recovered, and these represent uh, two different time periods. Plummets, uh, 
at the top here, uh, those are generally uh, interpreted as fishing weights. And so uh, native peoples would take a, a cobble, fairly soft stone comparatively, and they would shape it into these um, plummet or plumb bob like forms. And it, as I said, it's been interpreted that they were probably used as fishing weights. However, um, in other parts of the country, I've seen these interpreted as potential uh, weaving loom weights. So uh, if they're laying side by side, you have one higher than the other, they kind of nest inside of each other and they'll, they'll hold your, um, your, your strings down so that you can actually weave through them. So it could be another use for these other than fishing weights and um, it's worthy of more exploration. Um, Roe also uh, noted slate points at um, the waterside site. In slate points, you can see that um, they're often decorated, very finely made. Uh, usually, uh, these are associated with burial context, um, but we also find fragments of them in other, in other types of context as well. And then he also um, uh, drafted some uh, representations of, uh, of pottery. So these two um, types of material culture here, those are early, so those are probably about 5,000 years old. Um, pottery comes in later, and so it's based on these changes in artifact style that Roe um, determined that there were two distinct groups. Um, in recent years, uh, at the University of Maine, we've had students revisit uh, the waterside site, particularly with an interest in uh, the swordfish and changes in ocean temperature. Uh, Sky Heller was a PhD candidate who uh, worked for my predecessor, Brian Robinson, and began to uh, explore swordfish at a variety of sites in the Northeast. And uh, she was actually looking for additional uh, 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 species that, within the archaeological record that might also indicate warm water temperatures. Um, and so this is uh, Brie Ballard, who uh, had, uh, had an undergraduate research program or a grant to, to look for black sea bass, which um, Sky Heller interpreted as a potential species that would also be in the archaeological record if swordfish were there. So um, it's pretty nasty, <laughs> uh, the image that she has, but... Um, uh, this research is ongoing, and we have not, uh, Sky has not finished her dissertation. We're hoping that she will. Um, but it's really important research in terms of understanding what our uh, warming waters here, potentially going forward, um, might look like uh, if, um, with, with climate change. The other uh, site that I'd like to speak briefly about is the Taft Point uh, shell heap, and um, this is in West Goldsboro. It's another site that had received attention very early on. Uh, Wendell Hadlock investigated this site uh, in the late 1930s, and uh, you can see here, this is his excavation area. Uh, he put in quite a few meters of excavation, and um, he uh, did this work on behalf of the Abbey Museum in Bar Harbor. Uh, and during these excavations, Hadlock encountered one human burial, uh, which has since been repatriated to the Wabanaki tribes of Maine. And their material culture from this location is very similar to uh, what was recovered at the waterside site. And so there was, it was interpreted that there were two occupations and two different um, groups of people at that time. And um, so you can see here, these are some examples of the material culture uh, from the Task Point shell mound. Again, you see these um, plummets uh, here, very similar to what was uh, drafted by Roe, and also these slate points as well. Um, not very functional, I wouldn't think. Slate's not a very good hunting tool. <laughs> it doesn't make for a very good hunting tool, so it must have been something uh, ceremonial or some other kind of use other than hunting for these types of uh, uh, slate points. 
And then ceramics at this location, um, also pretty uh, impressive. Usually we don't see, we, we get small sherds of pottery very often, and usually we don't um, see things that we can refit to that size. And so uh, these date to probably anywhere between 2150 and 950 years ago. And um, again, we find uh, a number of bone tools that were recovered from this location as well as swordfish remains again. Um, so the point of highlighting these two sites is, uh, is to show that shell heaps in this part of Maine um, are particularly important because they are um, uh, relatively uh, old compared to many of the shell heaps that we find on the coast of Maine. The Turner Farm site on North Haven Island is probably one of the oldest uh, sites that we have on the coast. It dates to about 5,000 years old. But it has some of these same materials, swordfish, plummets, um, groundstone tools. Uh, and so this is a really great opportunity uh, to understand um, uh, deep time in uh, Maine's uh, indigenous heritage and coastal lifeways. So, um, one of the things about these locations is that, you know, they're frequently marginalized when it comes to historic preservation. And, um, you know, we, we do see a lot of effort going into the, the built heritage, and this is really important, and I, I am a historic preservationist, um, and I value this as well, but I, I do think that uh, given what the shell heaps can tell us in terms of not only uh, culture, but also environment, they're really important and should be you know, considered in terms of um, uh, historic preservation efforts uh, on an equal playing field with some of these other types of structures that we often think about when we think about historic preservation. And so, um, so with that, I am going to turn it over now to Dr. Alice Kelly, who is going to um, pick up on where I left off. And we'll take uh, questions all at the end. Hi, it's a real pleasure to be here, um, and thank you so much for the invitation to speak to the group. Um, I just, as a very short introduction, I came to archaeology as a geologist first and had the great fortune of meeting Dr. David Sanger. Um, some of you may be familiar with the name as, as a person who is very active in New England archaeology, particularly in the archaeology of uh, Maine and the, the Maritimes. Um, and I, I, through being a, a visiting sites with him, and talking with them, I became very interested in the idea of the interaction of people and landscapes and how people have used landscapes through time. And his interest was in shell heaps, or one of them was in shell heaps on the coast. So I got to visit quite a few. And then being married to a coastal geologist, I also visited a lot of sites on the coast. And the thing that I noticed as I was looking at shell heaps all along the main coast from southern Maine right up to the Canadian border, is that virtually all are eroding. Now, some more frequently than others, but as this happens, we are losing, as, as Dr. Newsom said, 5,000 years of Maine history, indigenous history, but Maine history. And so um, I began to think about what, what could we do with it? Yes, we know that there were um, shorelines that are now submerged, so we know that we've lost a great deal. So what we could, could we do to preserve what is happening or what we have today? And so if you look at this image, what we see are the problem with shell middens or shell heaps. They're disappearing. Um, they can happen through wave erosion, um, our big storms certainly to have an impact. Um, bank slumping, if you live or walk on the coast, you're familiar with this, you see trees coming down the sides. And also looting, um, sometimes called collecting. And I would like to plead with people to perhaps leave the archaeology to the archaeologists 
but there is an important role that you can play if you are interested in our local archaeology. And that is not by pretending you're an archaeologist and digging square holes like this person did on an island that is supposed to be protected by the Maine Coast Heritage Trust, um, but instead by walking the coastline and having your eyes open to see the things that are eroding. We know they're eroding, and quite frankly, there's a great deal of shell that has to be moved to find the sorts of things that Dr. Newsom has been showing you. So looking at those things, and as I talk a bit more, I'll explain how you can help record that history and be part of salvaging or saving this important history. So in the past, our shell heaps have suffered from um, mining. And we, we showed you a picture of the Damariscotta, the Glidden Midden. That is what remains. Um, but on the opposite back bank, you can go to the Whaleback Historic Site, the only indigenous historic site preserved by the state of Maine. Um, and see the remains of what was an even larger shell heap. Now, people were amazed when we talked about how many meters high the Damariscotta was, or the Glidden was, the whaleback was even bigger. But in the late 1880s, it disappeared um, by being ground up, put in barrels, and shipped off to be used as chicken feed and roads. So, some artifacts were saved. They're now at the R.S. Peabody Museum, um, but there was not a methodical archaeological excavation at all. Um, in general, they're not being mined, but I will say that they're not protected. The state of Maine does not have any sort of protection for um, these cultural features. They are protected only through trespass laws, and this is a problem, particularly on islands. People come back in the, in the spring and discover that the shell heap on their island has been excavated for fun or profit. These things are sold. Um, earlier uh, in the 2000s, uh, my husband, the coastal geologist, happened to be at Wells, Maine, and noticed dunk trucks carrying large amounts of <coughs> shell, clamshell primarily. And the next time he went back, he discovered that there was a condo on top of what had been an extremely large shell heap could have told us so much about the history of people in Southern Maine, um, but it, it disappeared to points unknown. So climate change impacts are certainly impacting our shell heaps. And I, um, one of the most obvious ones is sea level rise. When I started teaching at the University of Maine um, 30 years ago, um, I was telling students that sea level rise was two millimeters per year. And of course, that doesn't sound like a lot, but when you add it up incrementally, it, it's an issue, and particularly when we're looking into the future. Um, in my last lecture, that amount had changed to three millimeters per year. And again, doesn't sound like much, but this is data taken from two tide gauges, one in Portland, Maine, the other right down the coast here in Bower Harbor. And what we see is that within the last 20 years or so, the rate of sea level rise has increased. And um, that's not new to anyone who is following the news today. And of course, it's projected to increase at an even more rapid rate. And so we're looking at the impacts of sea level rise along our main coast as well as the, um, the world coast. And so this is going to impact these cultural resources. So what are those impacts? Uh, primarily one, the one that we're probably most familiar with, is wave erosion. Um, as sea level rises, those waves reach just a little bit farther. And then combine that with a spring tide storm, and it reaches even higher. And so these these features are being nibbled away, and in some cases, clawed away, like perhaps up to a meter in, in an erosive event. Combined with that, um, storms are becoming 
um, more frequent and more intense. And you've perhaps been seeing that um, as you, you live here on the coast. Also, with warming, we get more increasing freeze-thaw events. And this January and February were a great case study for that. You know, we talk about the old January thaw. Well, we had about three in the course of January and February. And so if you think about a shell heap made up of shells with pore spaces in between, when water is in those pore, pore spaces and freezes, it expands. It moves those shells apart, just like that pop bottle that you put in the freezer and forgot about and break the bottle. <laughs> well, it increases that. Then the water melts, it runs out, maybe takes a little bit of shell with it, but it opens up those spaces. And so these constant freezing and thawing um, does move things away from the edge, but it also softens up that midden front or shell heat front so that when those big storm waves come in, it's much easier for that material to be moved away. And of course, with that, we also get more undercutting, more slumping, and this is an example of a tree, but I'm sure you folks have seen this sorts of thing. So as we lose middens, we lose indigenous cultural heritage, main history, evidence of past life ways, people living on the coast for thousands of years, past environments that can help us understand past climate change as well as future, and then, of course, our sense of place. And if you're someone who likes to go to the coast, you know when something changes, and we as humans don't generally like change. So what are we going to do about that? Um, we have something called the Maine Midden Minders Initiative. Um, we started this, and, and Dr. Newsom has been part of this from the beginning with some funding from Maine Sea Grant, and we've developed a citizen science initiative to document the change and try and record the information that, that we, can, we can save. And so not going through each one, but we have a, a coast-wide reach. Um, we're really getting going before the pandemic. We're now starting again <laughs> to uh, put together our volunteer group. But we have people who are monitoring these sites all over the coast, and we would love to have some people who would be interested in doing it here in this part of the coast as well. So what do we do? Well, the idea is that we have an online training site, of course. We've, we've learned, like everyone else, to go online. Um, we have volunteers. We only go where property permission has been granted and documented, because most of uh, the shell heap sites are, in fact, on private property. Um, we protect this information. For a very long time, archaeologists didn't want to tell people where shell bins were. But we know that the folks who live in an area know where they are. And we hope that they're proud of them and that they're willing to protect them and to help to gain this information. But we don't want to have a website that then becomes the looter's guide to the main coast. So <laughs> by doing that, we've gone to a great deal of effort with University of Maine computer science colleagues to create a database so that um, the volunteers can give us their information and they can see how their information will be growing, um, but it isn't out to the general public. It's administrated, um, cultural resource manager, managers, tribal members, um, these folks can seek access and will be granted access. So one of the easiest things for people to do is if you have a favorite spot you like to go to, is to take pictures. Now ideally you would take pictures with a scale so we get a sense of, of dimensions, um, but a person is good enough. Um, taking them from the same place, that would be nice, but you'll notice that these three pictures have only a person in one of the images. And yet, this has been incredibly useful for us to understand what happens to this site on an island in Maine after we had a double whammy of storms 
in December and January. And what we see is about a meter of loss in one area. And when you're trying to involve scientific groups or funding agencies, anecdotes just don't cut it. But measurements and photos like this tell the story. Also, by documenting through photography, those artifacts are things that are found as you're walking the beach. And it's a simple matter of just taking a picture. And one of these things works really well. Okay? All you need is a pen, a quarter, your finger, something to give us a sense of scale. Um, that uh, stone tool there was collected by a 12-year-old girl who has sharp eyes and took notes of where she found it and let us know. Now, yes, it's out of context. It's not like finding it in a beautiful excavation, but it tells us what people were doing at that site. Um, Dr. Newsom can tell you about how old that is. I, I will always defer to her. Um, but that gives us an idea of age, of life ways, of what people are doing. So doing this, rather than taking it home and putting it on a windowsill or a mantle and removing that information from the world, take a picture and share it with our Midden Minders group so we can add that to the database of what is known about Shell Heath in Maine. And then we can get a little bit more scientific and do measurements. And so this was our first attempt at taking measurements to measure erosion rates. And it's pretty, pretty basic, two end base point end points aligned, um, and then measuring from that line. We used rebar for each end so we could find the ends again and reoccupy the site. Um, metal detector works just great. And so we could do this, and here in the picture, we had some folks um, doing some measurements at one of the Demerscata shell middens. And, you know, again, being old school, taken, <laughs> using that data sheet, but it works, uh, requires some, some uh, data entry, but that's okay. But then, of course, technology. And what does a university have but people who are good at technology? And one of my colleagues said, well, you don't have to do it with that tape measure and paper stuff. Um, we can make you an app. And that's exactly what they did. Um, and I won't get into the details, but it's basically augmented reality. You take your cell phone, you go to an endpoint, you go to the other endpoint, you say, let's measure this. And it draws little imaginary lines on the ground for you to follow and just click where the midden edge is, rather than tape measures, measurements and, and worrying about that. Is the line straight? And so here's an image of one of, our, one of the students trying it out. Well, we tried it out with the archaeology field school um, at Acadia, and there we are. We did it the old school way. We did it the app way, and we're going to find out how those things um, measure up, so to speak, in the next few weeks. And then, of course, we've taken to the air as well. One of my colleagues um, is um, a specialist in remote sensing. And by using a drone and timed photos around um, an area, and you'll see this is Taft Point, if you're, you're used to that, we've created a 3D model of Taft's point, and then we can go back and compare that model and measure the change. So here, rather than eyeballing the change, these are geo-referenced positions with uh, GPS points as part of the survey, and we have sub-centimeter accuracy on measurements at these sites. As an example, I didn't have an example from Taft's point, um, but I do have one from an oyster shell midden in the Damascata area. And what we found was significant change. And what was happening was this site is particularly vulnerable to east storms. And we happened to have two storms out of the east exactly a year apart. 
and we could see that change. Let's see if I can point this out to you. And I'm notoriously bad for, with these, so I might advance the slide. But what you see here in 2000, we, we did this as part of a school, a class at the university. See these nice aprons of shell that are there? That's the first erosion as the big waves were hitting the front of the midden and bringing the shells out onto the beach. The next year, almost exactly at the same time, another storm came in from the east, and you can see all of those aprons of shells are gone. That's been removed. All of that is gone. Now, what I don't have an image of is the storm that came after that then that apron of shells was not there to act as a buffer, and the next storm ate in even farther. So we're losing these, um, and these storms are really an issue. So in summary, um, not to keep you here too long, um, these shell heaps are disappearing, and the pace is likely to increase. We can't save them all. There's over 2,000 of them. There's a handful of professional archaeologists here in the state, and not all of them want to focus just on, on shell heaps, <laughs> although I wouldn't know why. Um, <laughs> But we know that there are these cultural and archaeological value. And so how do we save this information? How do we monitor the change so we have um, an idea of what is the best use of our limited cultural resource dollars? And how do we save this information? It's by calling on folks like you, who like to go to the coast, who probably have one of these in their pocket, to take pictures, to share the information you gather, and then, if you're really interested, to adopt one of these shell beds and do an annual survey, an annual measurement to um, let us know how things are happening. So and with that, I'm going to encourage you to be a middenminder. <laughs> and uh, here is our, our website. Um, if you type on Google, you main midden minders, you will find us. <laughs> and so we have a website, and our contact information is there, and we would love to hear from you. So thank you very much. Decomposition of the bone? Of the middle of the shell. No, I, not to my knowledge. Well, they're weathering, and so that's what that carbonate going into the soil is what is preserving the organic remains. Um, but decomposition of the shell heap itself is largely happening from the front. Yeah, I mean of the individual shells. Do they eventually decompose entirely, and how long does it take? I don't think, they start to turn kind of chalky. They don't look really fresh, but I've never seen a shellman where the shells are completely gone. No, you won't see a layer that, say for example, like the dark and light layer that I showed, um, you, you wouldn't see a layer of kind of decomposed white shell. Usually it's chips or fragments, um, but, Certainly not, nothing powdery or anything like no. that. As an example, and this is kind of far flung, but there are really old middle Pleistocene age middens in South Africa. And the, sh the shell is degraded somewhat, but it's still recognizable shell. You can tell what kind of animal it was. And how old are they? Uh, probably 100,000 years old. Mm -hmm. They're old. Different climate than Maine, though. We, we don't have those. No, we don't have those. But, yeah, it doesn't rain a lot. Or maybe yet. we haven't found them yet. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yes. The term skudik, we've heard that it means land's end. 
burnt ground? What does it mean? Um, my uh, understanding and based on my knowledge of the language is that it's based on fire. It's, you know, place of fire. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yes. So if we see something and photograph it, uh, do we go to your website and uh, email you the images? Email me images. Um, so with the scale is great, and with the location as close as you can get, and if you if you can take, put a dot on a map and take a picture of that, that's even better. As you may you may be finding a shell heap that we don't isn't in the state archive. So it's either adding information to something we already knew about, or putting another dot on the map, which would be. Just fantastic. And I would add that any artifact is important because you never know, it, it may be a, a plummet, and mm -hmm. that might tell us that the site is older than what we had already had on record. So, yeah. Uh, let's see, we've got, we'll start at the front and work our way back. What do we do with the artifacts we find? That's a good question. <laughs> so we've gone back and forth on this. Um, do you collect them and maybe have a repository locally that can keep them in, in some towns? That's what's happening. Um, in other cases, uh, some people are leaving them. And so all we'll have is what's uh, available in terms of imagery. And so I think local historical societies are great places uh, for um, to serve as repositories, uh, or uh, another option is to donate to one of the uh, tribal museums. That's another option if you do decide to collect it. We really haven't reconciled that uh, amongst ourselves on what the best practice is. We have a curation crisis going on right now, and um, you know many of these institutions are running out of space. Uh, but that being said, you know it would. Um, and this is just my opinion, but I, I think locally, you know, it's nice to keep these collections local uh, so that we can connect them to the place where they came from. Uh, let's see, going backwards, yes? Uh, about 40 years ago, I went to a, on a field trip with Harold Bourne. Oh, yeah. Down oh, here. Down, I, don't, I don't know where it was for sure, but we stopped at a midden. And it was at the foot of a hill. There was a house on the hill, actually. And it was in a little inlet. And uh, I don't remember the exact town it was, but nevertheless, it was on the edge of the water. I mean, there was marsh and stuff. So my question really is, did these things all start out at the edge? Are there some inland that we don't know about? Or are there some others that are probably out to sea that are gone? I would say I, the third. Uh, I would. All of the above. All of the above. <laughs> um, we know that sea level, well, sea level has been rising along the main coast for about 10,000 years. Um, and we know that people were here before that. And so it's, high, it's, it's likely that there are drowned sites. Um, and we know, in fact, that off of Bass Harbor, artifacts have been found that date to about 8,000, 9,000 years ago. Not an occupation site, but when you do the geology, put together the geophysics and coring, um, it would have been an ideal place for people to live. There was a marsh, there was a highland, um, just probably rich with all sorts of food and a nice, a nice place to be. Um, that, as sea level rose, has been covered. And so sea level rise has been just eating away at these at the main coast. Of course, rock erodes a lot slower than soft material. So anything that was on there has been weathered away. And so um, those are gone. We also know that there was a sea level high stand and people were here as well. And so there could be some very old sites inland that we don't know about. Just to follow up, the, the, some land over here, which I'm familiar with, but in, you see tree falls. Yes. And they're about a mile inland from the water. 
and the rocks are round rocks, just like you find on the shore. I just wonder. That was it, probably it's... an old shoreline. Is that, was that an old shoreline? Here, yeah. Tree throws are the best for identifying site location. Mm -hmm. You know, because what they'll do is they, they'll bring up all of the material that was deposited, and if you know, there's um, there's a site there. It's not uncommon to see material culture within those root roots. <laughs> Um, I'm going to the way back first. Yes. Um, about in the 90s, when I took my third grade class to Oakland, and we visited the Hinckley Museum, mm -hmm. and there were all these artifacts from Gould Girl, and from Cat Point, and I think from Shefflin Point, too. Um, and now I know that it became a charter school, that old museum. So what happened to all those artifacts? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. I don't have an answer for you there. Um, I'm, I, I know that uh, they did. I was aware that there was a material culture there, um, but I was not aware that it had moved from there. Um, well, I just, I, they, I don't think they have that museum anymore because right. I think that became a charter school. So I yeah. just wondered if they gave them to the Abbey Museum or if they kept them. Or that's something we'll have to look into. I, I'm just not familiar with um, what might have happened with those. Uh, they they could be in boxes there somewhere. In boxes? Well, in boxes. Oh, in boxes. boxes. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know. My thought was, Goolsboro should have some of those. Absolutely. Know? If they came yeah. from here, I, I might agree with that. And at least it gives you a sense of um, the antiquity of some of the material or the sites in some of in this area. You have a curator. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Final question. Oh, mm -hmm. is the app available to the public? Not yet. We're in um, the just the testing phase, uh, but we're hoping to make it, and it would be out through the Midden Minders project when that. So we would want to sign someone up as a Midden Minder um, before. We handed out the app, but I'm hoping in a year it'll be ready. It'll be ready just for iPhone. We don't have an Android uh, uh, program yet, but that would probably be something that we would build on. Thanks so much. Thank you.